Good evening. Good morning, if that's what it is. Uh, good day, everyone, wherever you are. Um, you're very welcome. It's my real pleasure um, and a privilege uh, as your outgoing secretary uh, to welcome you all to this virtual environment um, and to the opening ceremony of the 26th EAA annual meeting. The opening ceremony will be very similar in its programme to our normal live event, uh, but it will be somewhat shorter um, than it usually is, just to cater for its virtual nature. We have a very full scientific programme this year and a wonderful week ahead of us. So before we start, um, I'd like to just give you a quick outline of what the programme for the event is going to be. There are five programme slots in all. We will begin the evening with the formal welcome address from our president, um, Felipe Criado Guado. This will be followed by a statement from the chair of the scientific committee this year, Alexandra Andos. Our third slot, following tradition, will be the presentation of the European Archaeological Heritage Prize. That set of awards will then be followed by the presentation of the EAA Student Award. And our programme will conclude with a keynote lecture. It will be presented by Cornelius Holthorpe and it will be entitled Post-Corona Archaeology, a New Normal? So it's now my great pleasure to welcome our president, uh, Felipe Criado Boado, to our virtual stage and to this open up this unique event in the life of the EAA and this year's 26th. EAA annual meeting. Felipe, are you ready to speak? Yes, I am. Thank you, Margaret. Hello and welcome everybody to our virtual, but actual annual meeting. Wherever you are, we all are here now. My first words are to acknowledge and thank all of you for the endorsement of the organization of this meeting. And my second words, by the way, are to explain why Margaret Gowen is presenting this opening ceremony. Margaret is presenting because her term in the board comes to its end after more than six years. And we all must appreciate the strong contribution she has made to the EAA. My next words are, as usual, as always in that occasion, to remember, to keep some memory of these friends and colleagues, fellow archaeologists who've passed away this year. These are the ones we know, perhaps there are many or there are others, and we all are kept in our memory. Also, as usual, I'd like to acknowledge here our corporate members who are a very special kind of support of the EAA. One of the good things is that year by year, the corporate members' numbers increase, and this is very good. Quickly to say just some reflections that I want to share with you all. By now, this is the year of our generation. Since March, we have seen things many people wouldn't believe we have seen a full spontaneous movement of archaeologists and archaeological organizations everywhere to resist opportunistic tactics to weak, to weak heritage protection. We have seen many people mobilizing to support archaeological jobs in danger. We have seen innovative ways to create new opportunities for archaeological jobs. And further on, we have seen to rearrange and reopen archaeological field work in the current complex conditions and do it in record time. But the most unbelievable thing is being here, more than 1900 persons in this virtual annual meeting. Must be for sure the first occasion that this occurs. Almost 2000 archaeologists are joining online a real world event. We are experiencing something that for sure will become part of the new normal from here on. This meeting is, because of this, also an online experiment. 
I am fully aware of the criticisms that moving, moving to the virtual space arise between many. I am also sure that we will, we all will have different experience of the days ahead. There will be difficulties and there will be things that will work perfectly. But at the end, all this experience, whatever is better or good or worse, will make us wiser. Perhaps another president would insist here in the effort we have done to get here. Would insist in being the first archaeological organization that is doing such. Uh, perhaps would insist in the economic losses and risk, and also at the end in the financial balance. Would insist also in the world law to rearrange everything for the virtual annual meeting. But this president, the humble president I try to be, prefers to highlight the generosity of all, the large change of interactions, patience, calm in the middle of the storm, and a stream of full enthusiasm that brought all of us here. EAEA, EAEA is here to serve its memberships. This is the real important thing. And I like to believe that EAA membership is here to serve all our peoples, to help them, to help us by facilitating, facilitating knowledge and access to our heritage. What is the footprint of our traditions, wishes, struggles and resistance? We as archaeologists are very, very well equipped to pay this duty. After all, the only real aid we have to cope with current problem is this hundred piece of material culture. And archaeology, as you know, is all about material culture. How producing it, how using it, how managing it, how creating new spaces with material culture. I have always defended the view that archaeology and DAA ought to speak to contemporary issues and future matters. The future is all about our past and present, about our conflicts, about our struggles and also resistance. The better we cope with these old things, better our, our disciplines will be. This will also surely be reflected in the DAA itself as an organization for the future as an organization, fair, representative, and strong. These things cannot be taken by themselves. They require us to do things. And some of the things that have been done and we are doing, I would like to stress before ending this work. The first one that really goes together with what, what I have just said is that this year, we are presenting a new annual statement that this year is devoted to gender and archaeology, to archaeology and gender. A very important topic that we are presenting this year to the annual members business meeting to be approved by membership and to then become the annual statement of the AAA. To will get full information about what is going on, what was going on in the last months in the annual report, in the 2020 annual report, I invite you all, I ask you all to read the report and understand the information, the full information is there. Finally, I also must refer Initially, as always, but especially this year, to the elections. Every year at this time, we have an election season going on. But this year is very special. It's very special because we are electing a new incoming president, together with a new incoming secretary. Both positions are especially important. And beside all the other positions that are being elected for the board and for the nomination committee, we'll have to work together to lead the organization uh, ahead. But as you can imagine, it is the lesson of the incoming president that is 
the very, the very most important here. So once again, I pull you up to read the statements and to vote and nothing else. It is a big pleasure to be with all of you. And as all of you, I just miss to have a cold beer and one corner or the other of this annual meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Felipe, and thank you for your kind words. Um, I would now like to welcome Alexandra Andes, the chair of our scientific committee, to speak to you all. The committee, by staying with us, uh, following a very difficult decision to cancel Budapest, were really instrumental in um, our ambition um, and also our decision to hold this year's meeting as a virtual event and, of course, with a full scientific program. And more importantly, however, as Felipe has just said, it was you all, the members of EAA, that held us together and helped us to succeed in our ambition to host a full scientific program this year. Sandra, are you ready to speak? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Margaret, and good evening, everyone from Budapest. Let me tell you a story. It all began as usual in the history of EA. Representatives of the EA Executive Board and the organizers of EA 2020 Budapest elected the members of the Scientific Committee. Next, together with the SEC, we determined the main themes that would provide a framework for the dialogue at the AM. We strove to choose themes that would cover the most important issues commanding the interest of EA members and would at the same time also reflect the local flavors and concerns of the host country. Accordingly, some of the themes have a global relevance such as networks, networking, May I have the slide? And uh, sustainable archaeology and heritage, waterscapes, archaeology and heritage of fresh waters, and terrorism methods in archaeology. Two teams focus on regional and local histories within the broader context of Europe and archaeology and heritage from archaeology of borders, connections, and roads and embedded in Europe and archaeology, the Carpathian Basin. The seventh theme addresses to the history of EAA. That have occurred since its foundation, 25 years after the change of the annual meeting in Santiago. On a rather cold and overcast day, can you imagine now, in November 2019, at a partly in-person and partly virtual meeting, we finalized the conference sessions and call for contributions was opened from December. We received 2,600 paper proposals by the February deadline, which were first screened and approved by the session organizers Version points. It all seemed if, if we would organize in Hungary the second largest day after Barcelona. And then, out of the blue, everything was turned upside down in mid March. The outbreak of the COVID 19 pandemic affected not only the EA 2020 Budapest, but the life of virtually every human being on Earth. Never before have we experienced our vulnerability and helplessness to this extent as amidst the crisis of pandemic, which was in part perhaps caused by our excessive self-confidence for our hubris. At the same time, the crisis revealed the dormant power of communities and networks, which will be of immense aid in getting to the situation and surviving it. When the EAXB decided not to cancel or postpone the year meeting, but to move it online into a virtual space, every member of the SEC decided to put even more effort into ensuring that the VIM would achieve its set goals. 
In this situation, the role of the scientific committee and the role of the scientific program gained even more prominence since obviously the social events, which are always one of the main attractions of the AM, are not the same online in a virtual space as when we can meet personally. The world hasn't stopped, merely faltered for a moment. Research projects are underway. There is a definite hunger for dialogue and for the personal presentation of research uh, results. That's reflected by that over 170 sessions with uh, uh, eight, 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 nine, for, sorry, 1,400 presentations have confirmed their participation in VAM. We are in the midst of unusual times with immense challenges ahead of us. While there were quite a few cancelled sessions, not all of the authors cancelled their presentations, and about 180 contributions have been added to the general session. The task of the SEC was to create thematic groups with six to 12 presentations selected from these contributions. The conference motto is networking. The power and adaptive capabilities of networks, their flexibility, and resilience is ultimately determined by the number of connections. Different networks connect through nodes. The ES Center in Prague has always played a prominent role in connecting networks, and its role increased manifold during the past few months. The EA's proficiency in organizing the AM and the new innovative approach steered us through these difficult times, and we are deeply grateful for the commitment of the EEA Secretariat to find a viable solution, to whom I wish to extend a heartfelt thank you in the name of all participants of the EM. For without them, we could hardly have managed to forge ahead and hold this year's EM, even if in a virtual space. I also wish to thank the members of the SEC, the session organizers, and each and every one of you who will hold a presentation for your work and for your perseverance during the difficult times and in the coming days. The stories are the bonds between us. The story from 2020 will hopefully be an inspiration and a source of strength and resilience in the EA community. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra, for that. Um, we now come to our third guest of the programme, Catalin Wolak, who will present the European Archaeological Heritage Prize. Heritage Prize Committee, Franco Nicolas, cannot be with us. So Catalin, who is a working member of the committee, has kindly stepped in to present the awards. Prizes are awarded in two categories, with an institutional prize and an individual prize. I'd now like to welcome Kathleen to our virtual stage um, and to present this year's prizes. Are you ready, Kathleen? Yes, Margaret, thank you. Thank you. The European Archaeological Heritage Prize of the EA dates back more than 20 years. The 22nd award ceremony is taking place this year, and the 29 individuals or institutions have received the prize so far. Applications are evaluated by the Heritage Prize Committee, the current members of which are Franco Nicolis, who chairs the committee, Nathan Schlangen, Marie-Louise Stieg Sorensen, Narkan Yalman, and myself. The evaluation is based on the criteria specified in the code, taking into consideration the candidate's scholarly and societal output, as well as their achievements in heritage management and the political impact of their results. The award is handed out for outstanding contributions to the creation and dissemination of knowledge on archaeological heritage and for the protection, presentation, and enhancement of European archaeological heritage. Since 2018, the prize has been awarded in two categories. In the individual category, for an outstanding scholarly contribution and or personal involvement. In the institutional category, for local, regional, national, or international initiatives, long or short term, which contribute to the preservation and presentation of 
European archaeological heritage beyond the normal duties of the institution. Despite the current difficulties, this year proved highly successful. We have received many excellent proposals and the committee took into account the added value in the evaluation of a successful project or a well-functioning institution. One proposal concerned a person who, however, suggested that the program should be awarded instead, which the committee observed. Among the applicants, researchers and institutions from 10 countries, there were universities, research institutions, museums, heritage sites, state services, and different individual state or civil society supporters of archaeology. Before introducing the winners, please allow me to say thank you for all the proposals and also thank each nominee for their remarkable contributions. The winner of the European Archaeological Heritage Prize in the individual category is Dr. Jilikar, University of Cambridge. Let me read the laudatio for Dr. Jilikar. The management of archaeological heritage is a challenge for all societies and often especially for smaller communities with answers found deeply rooted in traditions, in social practice and in heritage awareness. It is an ever more difficult challenge when the archaeological remains relate to recent historical events, opening up an array of different memories and emotions. Dr. Jilly Carr undertook this task when she researched and evaluated the period of Channel Islands history under the German occupation, 1940-1945. The Channel Islands had a for long encountered difficulties when attempting to engage with and agree to accounts of this period. The reasons for the resistance against engaging with the island history had to do with the silence about the victims of Nazism in the islands and the cooperation with Nazi Germany, as well as the British war narrative that marginalized the fate of the Channel Islands. With the system of fortifications built as part of the Atlantic Wall with bunkers, dungeons, canals, and prisoners of war camps, the islands were one of the most important parts of the German World War II defense system. Prior to caste labor, there were few and poorly preserved memorial sites on the islands referring to this period. The island Guernsey had no memorial to the resistance. The Jewish memorial erected 2001 was twice vandalized. There were no credible commemoration of the labor camps and the victims, and the Holocaust Memorial Day was not really celebrated. The situation on the island of Jersey was better, but even there, the main exhibition about the German occupation was outdated and the victims of Nazism marginalized. Kass worked over the last decade has combined sustained heritage activism and scholarship in this region. Some of the most important results are the erection of monuments, museum exhibitions, including the new exhibition gallery, replacing permanent exhibition with more information on Jews and political prisoners, dissemination through media like BBC documentaries, website storytelling, new social media groups, public speeches, newspaper articles, local TV and radio interviews, and educational materials, co-organization of Holocaust Memorial Day ceremonies, designing resistance heritage trace, excavation of a forced labor camp in Jersey, advocacy both in the island and in the UK. Between 2014 to 2019, she dedicated and published three monographies on the theme. Kaas activity has transformed awareness about the Channel Islands victims of Nazi, persecution both locally and internationally. The impact of caste research has changed attitudes and transferred awareness of Channel Islanders towards victims of Nazism with their own, with their own, in, in their own community. In setting forth this lost history of the Channel Islands, 
car has helped to change understandings internationally as well. The above duly justifies the award of the European Archaeological Heritage Prize 2020 of the European Association of the Archaeologists to Dr. Jilly Carr. I congratulate her on behalf of the EAA. Let us see the winner's video now. It's a real honour to receive this award and uh, it's come as quite a bright spot in what has otherwise been a dark year, I think, for all of us. And I'd like to start by thanking the EAA Heritage for selecting me as the winner for this year's prize and it came as a, such a lovely surprise. I'd also like to thank my colleagues at the University of Cambridge for their support, most especially James Barrett in the Department of Archaeology for nominating me and the Cambridge Heritage Research Centre, directed by Mary Louise Sorensen, who I think is an, an earlier uh, winner of this award, for providing a warm home for those in Cambridge who have studies. I'd also like to single out Nick Saunders, my mentor for nearly 15 years, to thank him for his support. And I think that many of us who work in conflict archaeology owe him a debt of gratitude for his encouragement and inspirational guidance. And I'd also like to thank my husband and family for their cheerleading behind the scenes. Um, and I, I just want to say that I was awarded this prize for my heritage activism on behalf of victims of Nazism from the Channel Islands, which was occupied from 1940 to 1945. And although I've worked on behalf of um, all categories of victims and survivors from that period, so deportees, forced labourers and Jews, it is most especially the political prisoners who have a special place in my heart. Um, they were those who were imprisoned or deported to Nazi prisons, concentration camps and labour camps on the continent for acts of protest, defiance and resistance. And during and after the occupation, they were seen by most of those in positions of authority in the Channel Islands as troublemakers who deserved everything they got. And their experiences in prisons and camps were seen to be a punishment of their own making. And they didn't receive any honours after the war. And their memory has never been rehabilitated, uh, or at least until I began my work. And I hope I've helped to change that a little. And I therefore wish to dedicate this award to the political prisoners in the Channel Islands. And it seems appropriate to do that in this year of the 75th anniversary of the liberation of the camps. And at a time when nationalism and far right politics is once again increasing in Europe. So I dedicate the award to those who fought against such ideologies. The winner of the institutional category is the remains of the Greenland program and network. Let me read now the laudatio for the remains of the Greenland program and network. Preserving the vast but rapidly deteriorating Arctic archaeological heritage has been a frontline focus in contemporary archaeology. The national museums in Denmark and Greenland have made major contribution to archaeological understandings of the dynamic effects of climate-driven ecological and environmental change affecting Arctic archaeological heritage. The Remain Project, Research and Management of Archaeological Sites in a Changing Environment and Society, investigated between 2016 to 2019 the short and long-term effects of climate change on the preservation of archaeological sites and organic artifacts in south southwest Greenland. During four years of fieldwork and multidisciplinary research, 
groundbreaking results have been achieved, not only on the changing environs of West Greenland, but also on the Circum Arctic as a whole. Although the pro project was completed last year, its main objectives were carried forward by the members of the network formed during the project. The continued observation and monitoring how climate change influenced the preservation of archaeological heritage to initiate research-based cultural resource management tools for locating sites at risk to develop strategies for managing threatened sites in Greenland. Students from several universities also participated in the project and interdisciplinary research generated the preparation of ME and PhD thesis. The researchers have also developed new modeling tools to predict the future loss of archaeological deposits and have carried out the first ever ar archaeometric regional multi-threat assessment of archaeological sites threatened by climate change. The leader of the project, Jürgen Hollesen, and the members of the network were determined to disseminate to the public as well, educating and presenting on the dilemma of climate change to Arctic archaeology. The inclusion of indigenous concerns regarding Greenlandic cultural heritage was also part of the agenda. The significant scientific publications, professional workshops, like last year EA Roundtable Climate Change and Heritage, and actions in international forums are examples of attempts to bridge the gap between academic and public audiences. In view of the above, this network can be considered an outstanding advocate of archaeological heritage preservation in a European, in a European region in direct danger of imminent devastation of its archaeological legacy. For all these reasons, Remains of Greenland Program and Network is awarded the 2020 Institutional European Heritage Prize of the European Association of Archaeologists. On behalf of the EA, I would like to congratulate the winner, especially Jürgen Hollesen, the National Museum of Denmark, who was and is the key figure in this network. Let us see now the winner's video. Hello everyone here from Copenhagen. My name is Jan Hollesen and I have been PI on the Remains of Greenland project for the last four years. On behalf of my colleagues, I would like to thank the EAA and the Heritage Prize Committee for the award. It's a great honor for us to receive it. I would also like to thank Velux Foundation for financial support as well as the National Museums of Denmark and Greenland and the Center for Permafrost at the University of Copenhagen. Finally, I would like to thank all the researchers and students involved in the project. It's been a great honor to work with you. We have prepared a short video that we will show now. So thank you very much.
Finally, allow me to introduce the runners up of the institutional category as the second and third highest score have been achieved by the Sarat Safeguarding Archaeological Assets of Turkey project and the Splash Coast Network. Uh, let me invite you to see the videos of the runners up. Thank you for your attention. Now, the next slot in our program is the award of the prize. Uh, this is usually presented uh, by the Journal of Archaeology in Australia and so cannot be with us. So it's the EJA's reviews editor, Martha Diaz Guarnino, who will present the winner of this year's student prize. And this will be followed by a short pre-recorded statement by the winner. Are you ready to speak, Martha? Yes, thank you, Margaret. Yes, so uh, the EAA Student Award was instituted in 2002 to recognize the best paper presented at the EAA conference by a student or archaeologist working on a dissertation. Papers are evaluated uh, for their academic merit and innovative ideas by the award selection committee, composed of representatives of the EAA executive board and is chaired by the general editor of the European Journal of Archaeology, uh, Kate Freiman. The award consists of a diploma and uh, one or more book vouchers. Uh, the winning presentation will be considered for publication uh, in the European Journal of Archaeology. Uh, the 2020 Student Award uh, goes to Samantha Leggett uh, for her paper tackling early medieval transitions using hierarchical and multi-isotope uh, approach. Biomolecular studies have become a common feature of archaeological research over, over the last few decades. 
This field has given us new tools to assess the life ways, practices and histories of mobility of past individuals. In her paper, tackling early medieval transitions using a hierarchical and multi-isotope approach, Samantha Leggett takes the next logical step in this field. She conducts uh, a series of complex meta-analysis of th thousands of isotopic data points from medieval Europe in order to draw out spatial and temporal patterns in this increasingly large body of data. Among the many strengths of Leggett's approach is her pioneering use of unsupervised machine learning to facilitate statistical analysis of archaeological biomolecular data. These data are drawn from a number of different domains of study, from diet dietary isotopes to isotopic mobility research, allowing her to develop a complex and multiscalar model or major, of major medieval transitions, including crystallization, the emergence of new economic practices, and changing agricultural systems. Uh, as archaeological data proliferate and more are made uh, easily accessible through open data repositories, we expect this sort of big data research to uh, become a standard part of quantitative archaeological research. Leggett's vision here is instructive. She does not limit herself to simple causes, but embraces the complexity of her data and allows it to fit into equally complex and entirely social conclusions. So we have also a video uh, recorded by Samantha. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I would like to thank the EAA Executive and the Student Prize Committee for awarding me the Student Prize for this year. It is such a huge honor. Uh, to be joining the ranks of so many amazingly career researchers who have been recipients of this prize before me. Uh, absolutely humbling. I would like to thank my supervisors, Suzanne Hackenbeck and Tamsin O'Connell for their feedback and support over the last four years. It's been really invaluable in shaping this research. I've been asked by the committee to briefly present a summary of my winning paper, uh, which is entitled Tackling Early Medieval Transitions Using a Hierarchical and Multi-Isotope Approach. And if anyone is interested, please do come along on Saturday where I will be presenting the paper in full in session 356. In brief, the paper is all about looking at socio-environmental transitions in the first millennium AD, mostly in Western Europe. I use some novel statistical approaches to really try to break down these transitions and tease apart uh, interactions during the first millennium AD. And I've collated a huge database of published and primary isotope data, some of which I've done myself, to get at these questions and look at changing resource use and mobility patterns across the first millennium AD. My findings have really wide ranging implications for my primary case study, which is early medieval England, but Europe as a whole. And I really wanted to contextualize England with its European setting. And I think I've got some pretty exciting results to show. So thank you again for this award. Uh, it means so much to me uh, as a newly finished PhD student. I couldn't think of a better um, hand in present, if you will. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing you all virtually in sessions across this week, and I welcome your feedback and thoughts on my paper on Saturday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, now, we're going to have a little bit of a step back because there was a second video to be shown um, in the runners-up category uh, for the European Archaeological Heritage Prize, and I think we should see it. Um, and so um, I believe it was due to a connection failure. Um, I think uh, Christy is ready to screen it now. So I think if you could go ahead, Christy, please. Thank you. From the University of York, and I'm speaking today as the chairman and spokesperson of an international research network called Splashcots, which was set up in 2009 to promote the investigation of those vast underwater landscapes offshore of our modern coastlines 
which were lived in human landscapes for tens of thousands of years before they were finally drowned by sea level rise about 6,000 years ago. These drowned landscapes hold the key to understanding some of the most important developments in our early history. They're a valuable part of our European cultural heritage. The archeological evidence is little known, it needs investigating and it's under constant threat of destruction from many sources. Thanks to funding from the EU cost organization, Cooperation in Science and Technology, we were able to bring together something like 200 people from 26 countries, including archeologists, marine geologists, climate specialists, people from heritage organizations, museums, government agencies, and offshore industries to promote the significance of this underwater theme to the widest possible range of audiences, including policymakers and legislators. We were able to hold a series of intensive meetings and workshops and conferences to develop ideas about research collaboration and grant applications to fund short training sessions and placements for over 60 early career researchers across Europe and to produce publications, including a series of edited volumes of which the most recent has just been published as the Archaeology of Europe's Drowned Landscapes, along with an online interactive publicly available database with information about all the currently known underwater prehistoric archaeological sites in Europe, which is about 3000. And all this information, by the way, you can find on the Splash Cost website. This experience has demonstrated to us the, the value of international collaboration, of sharing ideas and data and resources across national boundaries and across disciplinary boundaries as well. And I think this is going to become a more common and a more necessary feature of future archeological investigations. This sort of international collaboration is of course also uh, central to the ideals of the European project, which I'm a passionate believer in. And it's therefore a great pleasure for me, on behalf of all the participants, and members of SPLASHCOS over the past 10 years and of all the institutions involved, to thank you, the EAA, for recognizing our work through this Heritage Prize. Thank you again. Now, I'm very glad we saw that presentation. And so we come to the final point in the program and the highlight of the opening ceremonies um, evening, our keynote lecture. Um, I'm being delighted to welcome our guest speaker, Cornelius Holtorf, to present to us. Cornelius will be familiar to many of you. He's a member of EAA. Cornelius is professor of archeology span and holds chair on Heritage at Linnaeus University at Kalmar, Sweden. He also directs the GRASCA, the Graduate School in Contract Archaeology. And he has been a member of the AA actually since 1994. It was Cornelius's research interests that identified him clearly to us, the AA officers, as someone who should surely speak to us in this strangest of years when the future seems very, very uncertain. His interest in commercial, uh, con contemporary archaeology, heritage theory, heritage futures, memory across generations, and uncertainty in heritage suggested to us that he would be ideal, and indeed he has not disappointed. So Cornelius is now going to speak to us about post-corona archaeology, asking if we face a future that will lead to the creation of a new normal. Cornelius, are you ready to speak? Yes, I think I am. Good evening, everybody from Sweden, as they say. Thank you very much for the um, invitation to give this lecture to all of you um, tonight. I will uh, start my PowerPoint here. So you see the picture. There we go. 
The uh, title of the, this lecture, as Margaret said, is Post-Corona Archaeology, Creating a New Normal. And uh, I think I will be talking for about 20 to 25 minutes, so it is slightly shorter than um, a normal opening lecture. I hope that's in the interest of um, the audience. And I want to present three lessons that I think uh, can be drawn or, or that I would like to propose as um, possible uh, lessons for a post-corona archaeology that could become part of the new normal that we are in the process of um, establishing. Archaeologists study the past and its remains, but this year all is different. The coronavirus disease that started in 2019, or COVID-19 for short, has imprisoned all of us in the present, and we worry most about the future. As always, archaeology cannot escape its present. The impact of the pandemic on our sector is partly economic. Archaeologists have been subjected to increased unemployment, layoffs, and compulsory short-time work. As schools were closed in many countries, and all citizens have been encouraged to practice social distancing or were essentially confined to their homes and workplaces over many weeks. Many pedagogical programs were cancelled, and there has been a drastic reduction of visitors to archaeological sites and museums. With all the financial consequences, this entails for the concerned institutions. But what are the intellectual implications? What can archaeologists contribute to understanding COVID-19? Museums have already started to collect items and stories that are intended to tell future generations of our current experiences, the hardship, but also the creative adjustments. Post-corona archaeology may soon emerge as a form of contemporary disaster archaeology, focusing on the material evidence of the strange year of 2020 when a lot more suddenly changed in society and in people's lives than we previously imagined was even possible. Mind you, this was not the first global crisis for any of us. Many recall very vividly the events of 9-11 in 2001 and the subsequent rise of global terror linked to Islamic extremism. We also recall the tsunami in the Indian Ocean at Christmas uh, 2004 and the global financial crisis that started in uh, 2007. We remember the nuclear cat catastrophe at Fukushima in 2011 and numerous earthquakes elsewhere that occurred over the past two decades. Last but not least, there were the recent outbreaks of SARS, bird flu and Ebola. COVID-19 and its impact constitute yet another global disaster that archaeologists need to get their heads around. Are there any lessons archaeologists can help society learn from the current crisis for the future? We often claim these days to be working for sustainable development. What could this mean considering the post-corona world? Archaeologists are well aware of the impact that historical disasters have had on social, cultural and economic development. But what will be or should be the long term implications of COVID-19, if any? Perhaps most relevant in immediate post-corona society will be the question, which disaster will strike us next? What can we know about the future anyway? Do we have more to say than the fortune teller down the road? As it turned out, coronavirus, the coronavirus pandemic was not only foreseeable, but it was also foreseen. Indeed, we know much more about the future than we sometimes are prepared to admit. We do know about ongoing climate change, about the emergence of artificial intelligence, aging populations in many parts of the world, the demographic and economic rise of Asia, urban growth, and continuing global inequalities. All these discernible trends will bring major changes to societies around the world over the next few decades. So maybe the right question is not what we can know about the future, including any coming disasters but rather how our knowledge of the future and the major changes that we see coming can best inform present decisions so as to minimize human suffering 
and maximize development for the better. How to meet the needs of future generations has never really been properly asked in archaeology, despite it being wedded to the idea of preservation. How will the archaeological heritage actually benefit future generations for whom we preserve it, whether in situ or by record? We cannot just assume that what makes sense and is valuable in the present will continue to do so throughout the 21st century and beyond. Systematically addressing the question about the needs of future generations and letting the answers that emerge inform our actions in the present is one way of conducting a credible archaeology for the future. There are, of course, many details about the future which we will not be able to anticipate, even when we have an idea about some more general trends that lie ahead of us. Uncertainty about specific future events may be considered as a disabling barrier for successfully foreseeing and planning ahead, especially when the scope is longer than a couple of years. But this kind of uncertainty is also empowering. It enables us to make creative choices in the present. And perhaps more than anything else, it also demands from us to assume responsibility for our own actions. The uncertainty of the future poses an important question to us. What kind of new post-corona normal do we want to create for archaeology and indeed beyond? We can make a difference. And here's a first lesson for a post-corona archaeology. Let's take the future seriously and do our best to ensure that archaeology actually contributes to sustainable development that would benefit future generations in concrete ways. So that was my first lesson, and I'll move on to the second part. The European Association of Archaeologists has been promoting networking and collaboration since its first beginnings in the early 1990s. This was a time when the Iron Curtain had fallen, but Europe was still very much divided into East and West. Over the past two and a half decades, the EAA has been bringing together many professional archaeologists and people engaged in archaeology and the past across all of Europe and increasingly also beyond. The EIA has been emphasizing our professional commonalities. Rather than celebrating or sometimes bemoaning the differences that exist in European archaeologists and in, in European archaeology, we have been welcoming each other as colleagues, not the least during the annual meetings that have been held in all parts of Europe and a wide range of sessions, round tables and social events. And you see on these maps, there are many red dots where the annual meetings have been held over the last 25 years. It is clear in the EAA, we share so much more than what divides us. We all benefit from getting to know each other. In the process, we discover not only shared interests and aspirations, but also common problems and concerns. Not the least, we have been discovering our responsibilities for each other as fellow European archaeologists and indeed as fellow human beings. The corona crisis has challenged much of this. We are not meeting physically this year. And after this lecture, we are invited to attend a somewhat different welcome reception where we will talk to each other over a drink enjoyed from home. This spring, we saw how nations separated from each other, not only in terms of the spread of the pandemic, but also in terms of border closures and in the spread of deeply felt sentiments on the merits of various national policies. Now, this is the map uh, which you, all of you have probably seen many times uh, this spring, and this is the version only a few days ago, which shows the various spread of, of COVID-19 uh, at the moment. As somebody living in Sweden, it has been a shock to me to observe how fellow Europeans in other countries portrayed Sweden's corona strategy in very unkind terms that did not at all correspond to my own experience and knowledge of what was going on. It was similarly surprising to observe how some rifts appeared between the Nordic countries and even within Sweden, when for a period Stockholmers, where the virus had spread most, were no longer welcome in their summer houses in other regions of Sweden. 
The resulting calls for increasing national and perhaps regional self-sufficiency are very worrying. Although we are all affected differently, and some a lot more than others, the corona crisis is a crisis that we are faced with collectively as human beings on this planet. It can only be overcome through collaboration, solidarity and trust between people, whether that is in public transport, at the workplace, in parliaments, in meetings among the European heads of government, in the United Nations Security Council, in vaccine research, or, and not the least, in our direct relations with people and societies in other parts of the world. Unfortunately, archaeology has a long tradition of emphasizing differences rather than similarities. We are good at drawing boundaries on maps. We distinguish between different types of material to discern different human traditions and behavior and how they changed over time. Indeed, we speak of something called material culture when we mean things, as if things can only be meaningful in so far as they represent specific cultures. Archaeology has also engaged extensively with all kinds of social hierarchies and patterns of conflict between different groups of people. It is fair to say that from the very beginning of our discipline, there was a concern with differentiation in the masses of material that archaeologists investigated. In recent decades, cultural heritage issues came increasingly under the agenda of archaeology. As heritage, archaeological sites and objects became significant indicators of unique cultural identities in the present. Every cultural group had their own heritage and seemingly needed their own archaeology, separate from that of their neighbors. On the global level, the World Archaeological Congress and also UNESCO have been among those emphasizing the need to preserve cultural diversity, which arguably now constitutes their main paradigm concerning cultural heritage. But cultural, cultural diversity implies difference and encourages perceptions of us and them, both in the past and in the present. Perceptions of us and them do not always bring about trust, solidarity and collaboration between humans around the world. Instead, they cement divisions that can make understanding difficult and may encourage mistrust and even hostility between people, prefiguring rifts such as those that COVID-19 has resulted in globally. Perhaps I would like to suggest the value of emphasizing differences and recognizing di diversity has at times been overstated. Maybe the time has come to focus more on what people have been sharing with, with each other all along. Maybe we should study more often how people collaborated and indeed collaborate with each other now, both within any one society and between them. Maybe it is time to put existing differences and inequalities to one side and make more of the many ways in which we all are equal and pretty similar, really, as human beings. Networks like those encouraged by the EAA are one important way for archaeologists to meet and connect with each other, overcoming differences and finding common ground. And tonight, I understand we are more than 1,900 people together on this forum. So this then is my second lesson for new normal in post-corona archaeology. Let's go beyond the notion of cultural diversity and focus on what people shared and indeed share, promoting trust, solidarity and collaboration between human beings on this planet. And this brings me to my third and uh, final section. Archaeologists and others have long been arguing that cultural heritage can make a wide range of important contributions to present day society and societal development. There have been numerous papers at the EAA meetings and also elsewhere about the significance of a variety of values associated with archaeological heritage in contemporary society. And the image I show here is just one example for this sort of terminology 
and the types of heritage values that have been discussed extensively. Unfortunately, during the corona crisis, it appeared as if much of this work has been conducted in vain. Archaeology and the realm of culture at large were commonly reduced to the economics of lost income and job redundancies in the cultural sector on the one hand, and the compensation of hardship through enjoyable cultural destructions on the other hand. UNESCO's Ernesto Ottone, Assistant Director General for Culture, for one, stated prominently that at a time when billions of people are physically separated from another, culture brings us together. It provides comfort, inspiration, and hope at a time of enormous anxiety and uncertainty. Now, this is actually a rather limited claim, selling culture and heritage too short. Forgotten are all claims that culture has the potential to contribute to a large variety of social, economic, and environmental development goals. Culture is not just about money and comfort. As recently as 25th of May this year, just before the summer, the Council of the European Union made a remarkable decision committing to a much more ambitious agenda, which is worth quoting at some length, as this is so new that not all of you may be familiar with it yet. This is the decision. And it starts like this. Sustainable development is a key political priority of the European Union and there's an urgent need to step up action in this respect. Culture is intrinsically linked to all three dimensions of sustainable development, economic, social, and environmental. And several fundamental objectives of cultural policies and measures at EU level converge with the UN sustainable, sustainable development goals and their targets, which form the backbone of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. They include fostering inclusion, diversity, identity, participation, creativity, and innovation. The impact of these policies and measures also fully complements the results of sustainable development, improved health and well-being, growth, innovation and job creation, and urban regeneration. This wide-ranging potential of culture, including cultural heritage, is significant in the present context. Cultural heritage has the potential to address some of the rifts I mentioned that, as an outcome of the corona crisis, have emerged running through individual countries, the whole of Europe, and indeed the entire world. Archaeology is not just about money and comfort, but it can contribute to promoting a culture of peace and understanding between the citizens of the world, promoting exactly the trust, solidarity, and collaboration I was talking about earlier. This cannot, however, be achieved with national archaeologies or indeed national heritage. And the same applies for supranational equivalents, such as the notion of a European heritage. Archaeology and cultural heritage must be forces of inclusion rather than exclusion. The culture I'm talking about can emerge from archaeological practice in two ways. There's a widely shared interest in the past of humanity and how we got to be where we are today. This story can be, and often has been, told as a story of different civilizations and cultures that connect to various present day nations and cultural groups. But it can also, and I suggest, had better be told as a story of human beings that in a variety of conditions around the world, led their lives together with other human beings, going through a variety of hardships but also accomplishing many feats. When engaging with archaeology and the past, we can relate to, value, and learn from the stories of all these peoples in a number of different ways. We may, for example, find ourselves in the same places, practice related activities, encounter similar hardships, solve comparable problems, or accomplish equivalent feats as they did. Equally important is the mutual professional understanding that manifests itself in the work of associations like the EAA. It matters how the two and a half thousand EAA members relate to one another, rely on each other, and support each other. It matters how they communicate and collaborate with each other in various ways, overcoming the existing language barriers. 
Similar relations also exist among other groups of professionals, of course. Together, the principles we practice may prefigure future society in Europe and beyond. There's a famous claim in the 1945 constitution of UNESCO. It says, since wars begin in the minds of men, it is in the minds of men that the defenses of peace must be constructed. Today, we might talk about humans rather than men, but the logic still applies. In the middle of a global pandemic that has become a global crisis, that has brought about a range of rifts and animosities between people in different nations, what could be a more honorable goal for European and global societies than working for peace? So this then is my third and last lesson for a new normal in post-corona archeology. span Let's realize more often the value of culture, cultural heritage and archeological practice to be inclusive and bring people together, promoting peace among humans, both in society and between societies. And this then seems to be as good a point as any on which to end. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much for that very thought provoking um, and beautifully structured presentation, Cornelius. It really was splendid. And um, it gives us all a lot to think about. And Felipe is saying in the in the chat on the side, um, loud applause. Um, and I think uh, that would be shared by everyone who has listened to you. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you very a much. Very good, a very good um, paper to launch us into this virtual annual meeting. Thanks. And I want to thank all of those who have listened in as well. Thank you for joining us. Once again, um, I'm absolutely delighted to be welcoming you all to this meeting and, as I said, very, very full week ahead, a very interesting scientific programme. I want to just mention the networking area. Do take time to fetch yourselves a drink or a cup of coffee or whatever and join other members in the networking area, which you will find on the left hand side of your screen with a little now saying on it. This will last about an hour. And I would just point out that the meetings in this networking area are one to one. They're random and they're very short. I think at most five minutes. So um, do join us there. It would be splendid uh, to um, meet you in that uh, environment. Thank you all for this evening and welcome. <laughs>